Welcome to the Ag Emerge Podcast, brought to you by Ag Solutions Network. Your farming challenges are unique, so your practices should be too. We're here to share emerging ideas, build connections, and provoke conversation. Get ready to improve your soil, your crops, your livestock, and your family's livelihood. I'm your producer, Kim Chase. And I'm your host, Monty Bottens. Thanks for joining us. Thanks for joining us. Today, we're excited to share Dr. Dwayne Beck's presentation from the Ag Emerge stage in 2020. It was there that I had the privilege of meeting Dr. Beck, but that wasn't the first time I'd learned of his extensive work in functioning soil health systems at the Dakota Lakes Research Farm. Monty had already had me reading up on Dr. Beck's research years before, and it was a critical part of helping me understand soil systems. Dr. Beck is a critical thinker. It probably has something to do with his chemistry background. Suffice it to say, you'll want to hear what Dr. Beck has shared with us. And in addition, there's a great opportunity to hear from him in person because he's one of the speakers at the 2025 National No-Till Conference this coming January in Louisville, Kentucky. You'll find the link to the conference in the show notes. But until then, here's some great information and wisdom from Dr. Beck. But once again, I want to introduce Dr. Dwayne Beck. He's, he's a real pioneer and innovator in uh, the entire soil health movement, and really it's, it's an honor to be able to have him here. So um, I hope he's kind and gentle. We'll see. He told me last night that, uh, why'd you put me at 8 a.m.? He must not like me, but we do like you, Dwayne. So come on up and uh, share with us today. Good morning. So I sometimes introduce myself, so we'll do, you know, Monty did the short version, so we'll do the longer version. But uh, just before the end of the year, we had one of our farmers who happened to make quite a bit of money this year, and he was trying to get his 179 deduction or whatever. And his wife kept reminding him that they really didn't need to take that. They could pay a little taxes and not have this extra expense on the books. And, but he said, well, I'm going to go to town. She said, well, don't buy a tractor unless you talk to me. And he gets to the John Deere dealer, and the John Deere dealer is showing him, they got this new thing, it's a <clears throat> voice-activated radio. They get him in there, and he goes, radio on, the radio comes on. And he goes, country music, and it goes to country music. And he goes, markets, and it goes to markets. He just couldn't resist. He had to buy that tractor. And he's kind of feeling bad about it, but he gets home, his wife said, you didn't buy a tractor, do, did you, honey? And he goes, well, you got to wait till you see the radio. <laughs> and she's not very happy and they deliver the tractor and he takes her out and they get in the tractor and he's driving around and he's looking at her reaction he goes radio on and the radio comes on he's looking at her reaction he goes country music and country music comes on he's looking at her reaction he runs in the shed he goes oh bullshit and the radio goes hi I'm Dwayne Beck to go to Lakes Research Farm <laughs> So, <laughs> so the Cold Lakes Research Farm irrigated dry land, about 1,200 acres, uh, some pasture ground uh, <clears throat> off to the west that we, we rent off in here, this kind of rough ground in there. And we actually have this land along the river. And we were just in the back talking about the Lewis and Clark expedition. They, <clears throat> I know the day they came across our land because I went and read their journals. And I didn't talk to him, but I, <laughs> but I know what was there. And, you know, it just, it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful expedition. It's a wonderful experience to read it. Every summer we have numerous people that come bombing down, down the river here. And our pump station's right in there. And <clears throat> they'll stop and we'll be talking to them. They say, yeah, I'm following the trail of Lewis and Clark. I'm going, well, you should do it from downstream to upstream, not from upstream to downstream. Because <laughs> it's, a, it's a lot harder what Lewis and Clark did than what these people are doing, but whatever makes them feel good. Commonality amongst tillage tools. All the tillage tools destroy soil structure. All tillage tools decrease water infiltration. All tillage tools reduce organic matter. And all tillage tools increase weeds, and I will show you that in this thing this morning. Yesterday was philosophical, today is practical. 
I made that slide one day when I watched a person give a one-hour talk on different kinds of tillage tools. Vertical tillage, horizontal tillage, deep tillage, whatever. And I'm sitting in the back thinking, how stupid is this? And so I'm making this slide, and this friend of mine kind of is sitting beside me. He looked over there and said, what you doing? Because I kept staring at it. I said, I'm trying to figure out if I'm a big enough a-hole to show this slide, because I was the next speaker. And that speaker closed up their computer and walked out the door, so it made it easy. And I, <laughs> I've shown it ever since. Uh, <clears throat> this is Kansas data. It shows that one pass of vertical tillage will increase your infiltration by 50%. Cut it in half. One pass of vertical tillage. You need to have that big hole open to the surface to let the water go in and the air go out. In order to make water go into the ground, you've got to let the air come out. And whenever you do anything to put a, a discontinuity in that pore, you know, whether big pores, little pores, doesn't make any difference. Any discontinuity, it just stops the whole process. And if you think about a soda straw, if you put your finger over the end, the water stays in there and doesn't flow. Okay? Same thing in soils. Very basic principle. The prairie takes in water because we, we have those continuity in the pores all the way down. Uh, <clears throat> organic matter and water. We've decreased the water holding capacity of our soils uh, immensely by reducing the organic matter. And probably the biggest thing about doing what we do is trying to build the organic matter back up. There's 27,000 gallons of water with 1% organic matter and 6 inches of soil. So if you've lost 3% organic matter from when grandpa started, which would not be uncommon, that means you, you have, have uh, you know, a, almost 100,000 gallons less water, uh, <coughs> which means it's 3 quarters of an inch less water that you hold. And if you, can, if you can increase that all the way down to four feet or something, then all of a sudden you, you, you can hold a heck of a lot more water, which is really important, whether you're in California or Montana or wherever it is, you've got a bigger bucket. If we can increase by 4%, that's one inch of water in the top six inches or two inches in the top foot. It gets to be a big number. And the other thing that gets in there, there's this mycorrhizal fungi that we talked about yesterday and we'll hit a little bit today, not only help you get phosphorus, they help you get micronutrients and they help you get water. So that tree that grows out of the rock in the mountains is getting water and it's getting nutrients and all these things from those mycorrhizal fungi helping it and it's giving them carbon in return. Uh, strip till, <coughs> a lot of people get excited about strip till. Uh, <coughs> we did strip till first in the 1980s. And then I figured out that it was a really stupid thing to do, so I quit doing it in the 1980s. And we haven't done it since. So this is somebody else's field. Uh, <clears throat> that guy ought to drive straighter, right? Ought to steer better. So you have somebody else do it, and he drives like that. How are you going to follow that? I had a neighbor of mine last year. He had the co-op come out and do some strip till for him. And, and the auto steer wasn't working well, so it went like this all the way down the field. And I saw him the next day, and I said, well, who, who are you going to have follow that, you know, when you plant next spring? And I was just, had a big grin on my face, and he wasn't very happy. So they gave him a bit of a discount, but who cares? And what, he, what you've done there is not only have you screwed things up, you got stuff like this, and now the weeds are going to grow more. So you increase your weeds. That's the reason we, one of the reasons we decided not to do it again. And then if you do that and you have a dry year, it's so dry you can't, you can't get the crop to grow where that disturbance was. You had two flushes of weeds, but you can't get, can't get the crop to grow where that disturbance was. So you have to move away from that to get to where moisture is. And now you're not close to your fertilizer anymore. I mean, all those things don't make any sense, right? And then if you go up and down hills, you get this happening. You get the erosion coming out of in, that, in that strip. And you look there, there's corn coming up out of, out of that little gully. And then how do you fix that? 
How do you fix that? Well, until you got to fix that now. So you have to get out your no-till desk, right? I like that. People talk about no-till desks and no-till cultivators. You know what an oxymoron is, right? Words that don't go together. <clears throat> no-till cultivator, no-till desk, political reality, military intelligence, all of those things. <laughs> So every summer when people come, one of the things I do is dig up a corn root. And I find somebody in that thing that's really big on strip till if they're there, and then we talk about why do they put the fertilizer underneath that row. There's no roots there. <laughs> and I can pick up a big corn plant, dig it up, and there's right underneath where the seed is. You can find the seed. Right underneath where the seed is, there's no root. So here's a little plant. Here comes a little guy. He perceives light. When he perceives light, then you start getting these roots coming out here, right? This, this little root here, this little radical, doesn't do much. Once, once you get to this point here, this, this thing basically quits growing. See, it's quit growing. It's not taking in any nutrients. It's mostly... Uh, taking in water, the seed is a dominant source of P and through V1, which is right here. No fertilizer nutrients needed, but could hurt if we had too much stuff in contact with the seed. And then once you perceive light, you start putting roots out above the seed. And at the, at later in the year, these are all the roots. These aren't anything. This all becomes your root system here coming out above the seed. That's why you've got to plant the crops like corn and wheat and what deep enough that they can form a root above, above the seed. But I dig, I dig it up and then I show the guy, there's no roots there. I'm going, why do you do that? Well, because Hefty told him to or somebody told him to, right? <clears throat> so, V2, the soil becomes a dominant source of P. And plant demand is, is maximum right there because you have just little tiny roots and your specific, what they call the specific P uptake is greatest right at this period of time here. We put our nutrients two inches or three inches to the side of the plant when we plant. And that's where that root hits it, right when it needs to hit it. Dig up the roots. You know, when somebody tells you some things like that, look at what the plant wants, not, not what this guy, wow, well, I heard, well, boy, you get, it looks bigger, right? <clears throat> Well, it's bigger, it's bigger, it's bigger, that corn's bigger. It looks bigger. Maybe it's bigger, maybe it isn't. You don't harvest corn in June, right? You don't harvest corn until later. So I don't care what it looks like in June, okay? P status at V3 and V4, and somebody else showed us that yesterday, influences that ears, uh, kernels around, okay? So here's our rig. Uh, yeah, it's kind of homemade. Uh, <laughs> we call it the concept seeder. So we demonstrate all kinds of concepts. This is a lot of years ago. It still had the cyclo drums on it. Uh, <clears throat> but we've got a residue manager. That's our design. You now can buy those that look like that, with that back swept design. Um, I'll back, back up. There, there's the ones you can buy. It's more like a wheel rake. So if, it, if that finger comes straight out, it flips up in the air. If it's like a wheel rake, it just pushes it aside, right? It's like a, a side delivery wheel rake type thing. There's a fertilizer opener right here. So we're putting the fertilizer three inches to the side, cutting the residue, moving the residue away, planting, and, and closing all in one spot. Now I don't have to worry about following it. I'm always three inches away. One of the problems we had with strip till stuff, even if they do low disturbance strip till, some guys are doing that, strip <coughs> fertilizing. If anything moves relative to, to where it's supposed to be, slides on the hill or one of the openers move or something like that, you kill, kill the, the plant with too much fertilizer. So we've had a lot, we've had a lot of that happen with guys that get something moves and then they go out and, you know, one guy, he, you know, he had like 36 rows and three rows out of 36 were dead. Now, how do you fix that? <laughs> You know, you go out there with one row planter on a, about a thousand acres. <laughs> so that's what it looks like. We, we try not to move anything else. Look at that matter residue, stripper headers, and that kind of thing. And then that fertilizer, we got a, we got a spot that's warmer, and, and we, have, we have a fertilizer three inches away. So 
pretty simple operation. You can eat a lot of residue. Again, we do that because of this thing. <clears throat> That's what it looks like. It may not look as big because it's hiding in, in that straw. Straw kind of, if you go out and measure it and weigh it and whatever, it's as big. Uh, I think the reason that people did strip till is because they didn't change their closing wheels. So way back 100 years ago, we started working on closing wheels. And the uh, Exapta Thompson wheel grew out of designs we had with Mae West and whatever. We were the first guys that put pokey type wheels on. And the other thing we do is we put this vertical thing in the trench that puts the seed into the bottom of the trench. Some people use Keaton seed firmers. Uh, <clears throat> we did wheels. I saw the Keatons. I went, what a great idea. I put the Keatons on. I had them on about a week and I took them off, put my wheels back on. And never have gone back to the Keatons. But uh, a lot of guys get by with those. So there we are, 250 bushel corn, uh, planting corn back through there. We move off to the six inches to the side. So we try to keep everything as tall as you can. Your residue, if you're going to be low disturbance, which you should be, keep your residue as long as you can. In the old days, especially in Montana, they told you to cut the residue into little tiny pieces, and then it floats and blows and goes everywhere. Uh, if you've got a hole opener, you need to cut it in little tiny pieces because dump rakes have teeth shaped like this. But if you're using Hoe openers, you're really going to have too much trouble with weeds and everything else. So uh, there's a lot of data now on this versus hose, and if you can keep your residue long, you'll cut that residue. It's not a problem to work with. We want to leave the residue in place. Uh, last year's residue, the best weed control is crop canopy. We want to keep last year's crop canopy in place till this year's crop canopy forms. It's a relatively simple philosophy. Uh, so, strip till. This is a study that Monsanto did, right? I guess they don't have Monsanto anymore, <laughs> but we did have a Monsanto. And they did this no-till, strip-till conventional. And they got this, this kind of thing here, right? But they had done it wrong, okay? They had done this wrong. But no-till still wasn't bad, but they'd done it wrong because what they did is they put fertilizer on with a strip-till, but they didn't put any fertilizer on the no-till. Okay. And I said, well, you know, you've got to make this the same. Uh, number one, it didn't make any money even with their thing there. But you've got to do it the same. So I said, let's do it. Same. So they put the fall, this is what they had done. They'd put fall phosphorus on and then spring phosphorus. So they'd fertilize it twice. And I said, well, you can't do that. So I made them do it this way. You know, we do the strip till without the phosphorus and see what happens. Right? Then we beat them. So you can't, you can't really, you know, you got to, devil's in the detail whenever you look at research. Now, one of the biggest things that we see response to in corn, irrigated and dry land, is placing nitrogen in the soil near the plant at seeding time. And strip-till does give you that response. If that's where you're putting the nitrogen on, you're getting nitrogen close to your plant. It's just not the best way, in my opinion, to do it, okay? But if you, <clears throat> we've done a lot of this work, uh, a lot of it was done a number of years ago, but it doesn't change the plants, they, they still respond the same. If you put nitrogen on top, 194, if you put it to the side in the ground, you know, this is on top to the side on top of the ground, and then the starter on the surface and just a little bit of pop-up, this is what a lot of guys are doing. Right, this would be your phosphorus on the surface broadcast, nitrogen broadcast, only we're putting it in strips here, and, and that's better. Still 194 and it's wetter. If you put the urea in the ground to the side, that, two, that three inches away, and, and the, and the pop-up 207, uh, urea the side, starter, pop-up on the surface 202, not really a significant difference there, but a little bit wetter. So, and, and if you look at this, it's very consistent. Again, we put everything on the surface, 197. So, um, <clears throat> 
You can just look at those. Every time we, we put the urea, the nitrogen on the surface, it's, it's less yield. And it just, and I've got these, I've got these, uh, you're going to get these in a, in a, I got all these data in, in a file that you're going to get. Okay, so Monty's going to give that to you. So you can look at them yourself. If you look at the Corn Belt, they do all these studies in conventional till, there's very little response to starter. In no-till, 8 out of 11 responded. And the response was 8 bushel. Okay? Now, the reason for that is the nitrogen's all in the organic form. We've done our cover crops and we've done all this stuff and we've got the nitrogen in the organic form where it's not going to leach away and it's not going to denitrify and it's not going to go away and it's not going to get in the river. But it's not available when the soil's cool. So for that first little while, we're going to give our plant some nitrogen and we're not going to give it to the weeds. Because if I broadcast my nitrogen, I'm feeding the weeds. And I don't want them to have any fertilizer. Okay? So that's part of our weed control program. Now, phosphorus is a bit different. So here, here we had an experiment where we did different things with nitrogen again, nitrogen to the side, and then some things with phosphorus. We put in over the row and over the row, just concentrated over the row. That's not good enough, okay? Put it in the middle of the row, it's still not good enough. Doesn't make any difference. Uh, <clears throat> these two where we had the nitrogen in the ground, that's the ones, that's the ones that shine. Here's the thing where we put all the nitrogen in the ground, we're looking at phosphorus responses, right? Very little phosphorus response there. Uh, and that's because we have the mycorrhizae. We do have a response to just a little bit in the trench with the, with the plant. So that's one of the things we're still doing uh, is, is a little bit of pea in the trench. And we might put the maintenance amount to the side because it's a convenient way to do it. But it, it, the P response, notice those Olson soil tests at five parts per million or less. If your fertilizer dealer saw that, he'd be going, oh, God, you're going to die. <laughs> right? Down here, we had nothing. No phosphorus at all, 204. Here's a study that we're doing, uh, on, again, on these really low... Phosphorus 5.3, 5.2, Olson 1.8, 2.3, Bray, 1.4, 2.2, Bray tests. Now why are those Bray tests so low? Because we're on calcareous soils. Bray test has an acid extracted. So if you do a Bray test on a, on a, don't let your dealer do this to you. If you have a high pH soil and they use a Bray test, they're going to get a real high recommendation. Because it just, the, the lime in your soil just denatures the acid in the test, and the test doesn't work. Okay? <laughs> Little hint number one if somebody's going, oh, God, you're Bob, you really need a lot of fertilizer. Okay? <clears throat> so, what happened here? Uh, this is just a, 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 a placement study, bandwidth to seed. This is on weight versus surface, uh, amount of phosphorus. It, 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 in, in concentration, 2.9 versus 2.7. Total biomass, 1,000 versus 730. Big difference. Phosphorus uptake at feet 6. Um, 6 leaf stage, uh, 3 and 2 pounds per acre. So made a huge difference. And so we're still putting a little bit on these real low testing soils. Now we're putting just a little bit of phosphorus in with the seed. Uh, <clears throat> this is on a different field where we've, over the years, we've put on 100 and 200 pounds of map three times. So that 100 pounds of map things actually over five year periods had, had 300 more pounds of map and the 200 had 600 more pounds of map. And you notice that the P uptake pounds per acre was the same with the check as everything else. And that's because of mycorrhizal fungi. <clears throat> we did a real fancy most probable number greenhouse takes six weeks to do analysis of the mycorrhizal fungi population, the one on the left is the check. It has twice as many mycorrhizal fungi as the ones that have had fertilizer. <laughs> That's kind of interesting, eh? And why do we want the, the soil test to be so low so it doesn't dissolve and go into the rivers, okay, or the lakes? 
because what they're measuring with soil test phosphorus is solubility now how much. These soils would have 1,200 pounds of total phosphorus in the top six inches. It just isn't soluble or available. But we got our mycorrhizae to help us here. Some started P with a seed, other nutrients placed near the row at seeding time or on the soil surface after crop canopy. We'll do that with nitrogen and weed especially uh, to, to manage the, the protein. Broadcast fertilizer before or at seeding encourages weeds. Uh, think about available nutrient moisture roots have to be all in the same place at the same time. And mycorrhizae are basically roots. So once you increase roots, you don't need as much available nutrient. Uh, cover crops. What happens if you put in cover crops? Well, cover crops do wonderful things to a certain extent, but they do sequester nitrogen, which is a good thing. <coughs> they keep it there and it releases later in the year. Okay. Uh, this is a study we did with a whole bunch of different, again, you'll probably get this in that packet, a uh, whole, whole bunch of different cover crops, and then we had a fertilized and a non-fertilized strip. So some of these, like no cover crop, there wasn't, there was like a huge difference in, in no cover crop, fertilized and non-fertilized, right? And then where we get some of the brassicas and stuff and cowpea and lentil, the, 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 there's not a lot of difference, but you're actually mining some organic matter doing those, only those. And it's interesting to look at those. For you guys doing silage corn for, for the dairy, don't only look at starch, but look at protein. Because there's a big difference in protein. This is on the grain itself, but it would be the same on the silage. Uh, <clears throat> there's some there's real differences in protein there. Here's a, here's a study where we had, uh, it was on irrigation, we had a, 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 a cover crop of lentil, chickling vetch, uh, turnip, that kind of stuff in between, in between a wheat crop and an irrigated corn crop. Uh, <clears throat> 108 pounds of nitrogen, nitrate nitrogen, we do soil test nitrogen stuff all the time, that to two feet or three feet. Yield goal 220, and, and with no fertilizer, we got 176. And then with 30, uh, 36 pounds of fertilizer, we got 236 bushel, and that's as good as it gets. So you can get some nitrogen out of those things at times. Uh, I'm a farmer, I take sunlight, water, and carbon dioxide, I make them the products I can sell. And everybody worries about being a wheat grower, or a corn grower, or an almond grower, or whatever, but it's really about harvesting sunlight. Uh, focus on having the soil wet during the dry part of the year, and especially in California. So if you can keep that residue on there, you'll stay wet. If you can hold more water because you have organic matter, you'll stay wet. Uh, instead of just focusing on having it dry during the wet part of the year, so in the spring, especially in the Midwest, they want to have it dry so they can plant their corn early. And then they can brag at the coffee shop how big their corn is in July. <laughs> we don't care. <laughs> Focus on having the soil cool, and especially in California, this is big, during the hot part of the year. That matter residue makes a huge difference. And, and even a growing cover crop will cool that surface soil versus having bare ground. Uh, instead of just focusing on having it warm during the cool part of the year. So here's a field of ours. That's a cover crop of uh, hay millet on the right. And there's some other stuff coming underneath there that'll come later, uh, like oats and barley and stuff. There's a milk jug sitting there. You can see how hard, high our stripper head wheat stubble is. So that's, you know, the stripper's a real, um, benefit to us. We've been using them since the 90s. Hardly anybody even heard of them in the 90s, but <clears throat> um, anyway. And that's your two different systems. You know, if you just leave the wheat stubble there, not much has happened, not a lot of biological activity, and if you get a bunch of rain, it's going to go, your nutrients are going to go away. Uh, <clears throat> here's one we do where that is swath, so we have the we have the taller stuff and the shorter stuff in alternate strips, and when we swath it, uh, that tall stuff, which isn't real resistant to rain, goes on the bottom and then the hay millet goes on top. And it, it will shed water better. So it kind of makes a, a better swath for us to swath graze. Well, uh, you're, you're cutting the one, cutting them in two different windrows and then putting the millet on top of this. 
No, cutting at the same time and the half the windrow, okay. you know, the outside part of the swather goes on the millet and the inside part of the swather goes on the tall stuff and you just, that folds it up on top. There's the alfalfa under the corn thing. Uh, this is when we just had corn everywhere and alfalfa everywhere and that didn't work well because the corn outcompeted the alfalfa. Then we went to putting it in strips. So there's our strips of alfalfa in the spring. They're growing long before we would plant the corn. And then, and then uh, we plant the corn, suppress the alfalfa. What we're doing is cycling the deep nutrients to the top. And some people are doing this with cover crops planted when they're planting the corn and stuff. We're trying to get the deep root and then we're trying to get, trying to get uh, that early spring grow thing. Uh, we want that deep root to bring stuff up. Uh, <clears throat> all of this stuff we call catch and release nutrients. It's like fishing, right? I stole this from a guy in North Dakota. You know, I was at a meeting one night and he, he used that term catch and release. I just went up and said, Jeremy, I'm going to steal that. And he said, thank you. <laughs> Whatever. Uh, so I steal a lot of things, Monty. See, he, he found out the... I thought Jay Fuhrer said that. Jay Fuhrer sold it from your guy. And so I, I wrote that down yesterday. I'm going to put that in my slide. So, Hey, everyone. Kim Sheese here from the Ag Emerge podcast. And I'm Liz Haney from Soil Region. Are you ready to immerse yourself in the future of soil health? Don't miss your chance to register for the 2024 Big Soil Health event happening December 9th through the 11th in Cedar Falls, Iowa, hosted by Soil Region. We're all about farmer first education training and networking to boost soil health, improve your quality of life, and maximize your ROI. After the event, we'll stick with you every step of the way through our consulting and community support. Don't wait. Join us for inspiring speakers and an incredible community of attendees that'll keep you learning and growing. Head on over to www.agsoilregen.com slash events to register now. We can't wait to see you there. Weeds and disease are nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks diversity. Uh, if you have other new natures and opportunists is the other way to say it. If you have a problem, you provide the opportunity. So figure out where that is. Don't reach for a jug or whatever or, or tillage tool, for God's sake. Um, figure out where you provided that opportunity. Uh, biological things, does the action that you take address the weakest point in the life cycle of an organism? Weed or insects. Well, let's take weeds, for instance. Where's their weakest point? Well, when, when do we try to kill them now? After they're up. Yeah. Well, yeah, after they're up, we, they, they, people try to kill them now because we've got these herbicides that'll do that, right? So that's good. We just wait to see what comes up and we'll spray them. Uh, <clears throat> That's not the weakest point in the life cycle of a plant. The weakest point in the life cycle of a plant is before it comes up or before it makes a seed, prevent it from going to seed, competition, sanitation, rotation, right? <clears throat> but we wait until after they're up and then we get resistance. This photo I took in the 1990s. The corn companies come up with something called an Emmy corn in the 1990s. Now they call it Clearfield or something resistant to pursuit, and I was talking rotations to a bunch of people, and a young farmer said, I don't have to worry about crop rotations. I got Emmy corn now. I put pursuit on my beans, and it kills everything, so I'm going, this is before Roundup Ready. I'm going to pursue, put pursuit on my corn, and I don't have to worry about weeds again. I said, you're going to have resistant weeds. And I got a letter. My boss got a letter. The dean of the college got a letter. Secretary of Ag got a letter. <clears throat> that they wanted a retraction because there was no proof that there was going to be resistance to pursuit. And there was no proof that there was going to be cross-resistance, which is the other things I said to other ALS herbicides. And they wanted a retraction. My boss called me and said, I think I know the answer, Duane, but is there any chance you'll retract? <laughs> and I said, I'll retract, I'll take care of it. I called the guy up and I said, I'll retract in three years if I don't have him. I don't have resistance to pursuit on the farm. I went over to my neighbor about five miles away that had been using glean forever, had resistant kochia to glean. I took some of these resistant kochia <coughs> weeds out of the fence line. 
took them over and shook them across one of our herbicide trials. That summer, I just called the guy up and said, you want to come and look at this? He said, no, I'm too busy going out and complaints. <laughs> Nature's efforts to add diversity can be added by, uh, countered by adding beneficial diversity to the system. We've had no need to broadcast insecticides at Dakota Lakes for over 17 years, which is really interesting. And, and it's because we have lots of predators, part of it. Uh, No-till is not about lack of tillage, but about managing soil water structure, soil biology, and carbon compounds in the soil. I like to think of it as, as try to produce a crop which is healthy, not one that doesn't get sick. I mean, I don't see anybody in here that's sick. But if we all hopped on bicycles across the street here and went for about a 20-mile ride, there's differences in health amongst us. I can actually do that now. But there was a time I couldn't have. It's basically a system. And if you just take tillage out of the system and don't change all this stuff, then you're in trouble. And that's what the first people tried to do. You know, the guys with the yielder drills and that kind of stuff, they just said, OK, I'm still going to do wheat and fallow. I'm just going to do it without tillage. And it was a wreck. And there's still people trying to do that and still a wreck. And corn, soybean, just going to do corn, soybean, not going to do anything else. It's a wreck. And it looks like that. The whole thing collapses. So let's think about cultural practices, technology, and management. If we take out tillage, which is one of the cultural practices, we have to replace it with another cultural practice. We can't replace it with technology. Because if we do, there's not enough technology available. That's where you get the resistant weeds. If, if you try to do that, uh, you can't afford the technology. It gets too expensive. If you try to do that, the consumer doesn't want you using that much technology. Right? So we have to use the cultural practices to do that. And when we started, we didn't have the technology. I mean, when we started, Roundup was 80 bucks a gallon, if we could get it. And we didn't have any of the ALS herbicides like the Pursuit and all those guys. We didn't have any of that stuff. And so we had to do it with other ways. So if we take the tillage out, now you're looking at rotation, sanitation, competition. In nature, tillage is a catastrophic event. Anybody, I don't think they should be able, able to label something as <coughs> natural if you use tillage. I mean, that should, we should change that law and say you, tillage is natural. Can't be part of what you call natural. Tillage to agriculture, what fracking is to petroleum, it increases the speed and extent of removal of compounds from the ecosystem. That's what tillage has done. It's a mining operation. <clears throat> and it leaves the ecosystem degraded. Short-term studies are not accurate in evaluating treatments such as tillage or crop rotation. It takes longer to do things. Uh, <clears throat> Cook and Vseth way back 100 years ago, <laughs> not quite, but in the in the 60s or early 70s, said crop rotation allows time for natural enemies to destroy the pathogens of one crop while unrelated crops are grown. You know, that's the basic idea. Uh, crop rotations, proper intensity, adequate diversity. You've got to get the water use right, that water cycle. Adequate diversity to prevent problems. You can be too, try to be too diverse, but you get enough diversity to prevent problems. You start having problems, add more diversity. Uh, native vegetation, the best indicator of range of intensity. Now, if you're irrigating, you've changed the native vegetation. So you have to rethink that thing. But uh, in any given location, the first thing I do is go look at the native vegetation. It tells you what you can do, what Mother Nature says you can do there. And then if you try to do something else, I mean, you're, you're, you're going to get your butt kicked. So. Most of the plant growth problems blamed a no-till are a result of inadequate diversity or improper intensity. Uh, put water saved by no-till to work. More high water use crops than cover crops or double crops to use water. Uh, we, don't, we use water pretty well with our grain crops on the dry land. We, we sometimes put in cover crops, but it's not a, an every year thing for us. It depends on where we're at in terms of moisture, and, and that's beyond today's talk. But, uh, we want to see at least three crop types, long intervals of two to four years. And that's, that's the biggest thing right there, the two to four years. And for a guy who's doing wheat corn, wheat corn in the same year, 
for <laughs> forage, I mean that's a two-crop monoculture. Corn, soybeans, a two-crop monoculture. Uh, and, and so we, that's one of the reasons we don't have to worry about disease and insects. So we got this, this, but the two is the important part. And that comes from biology 101. You have this lag phase when you, when you introduce something and then it does this, right? And then when you kill, when you, when you remove it, it, it's like this. And so you want, you want to have those longer intervals. Every other year, weed seeds, for instance, only, only about 60% of them germinate the first year. And the other ones wait for the second year, and a few of them wait for the third year, right? So by going every other year, you still have the weeds there. SDSU just did this big study. They found out there's fusarium that now affect both corn and soybeans. <laughs> and they're going, oh, well, there's not much we can do. And I'm going, yeah, you could rotate, put something else in there besides corn and soybean. So we had a long-term study. We did a half section. For you people from California, that's 320 acres. Uh, <laughs> we had a half section that we had 15 rotations. And it was all field scale stuff. 150 foot wide by 300 foot long plots, or small plots. That's how big they were. So we could plant and harvest them with regular equipment. Uh, we had all kinds of different, we had 15 rotations, cool and warm season crops. No-till was used, herbicides were used for weed control. We did it for 12 years. And then the last year of the study, the guy who owned the land that we rented it from, or the tribe, they wanted us to uniformly farm it for a year, so we planted it all to spring wheat. And a guy came out and counted all the weeds. I went out in the spring, he counted all the weeds, I sprayed my burn down, planted my spring wheat, um, and, and, <clears throat> and then he came back in June and counted the weeds again, so he counted them two times. And, and uh, this is what we found where we did wheat chickpeas for, for uh, wheat pea or wheat chickpea for, for 12 years. We had 94 weeds per square meter or square yard where we did wheat corn chickpea or wheat corn pea. We had 40. And where we did a pea, wheat, corn, soybean thing, we had seven. If you look at a pea, wheat, corn, soybean thing, not that it's good rotation, but if you look at it, we got peas and wheat back to back, which is two cool season crops. So in both of those, we outcompeted the warm season weeds. Uh, we had wheat and corn together in terms of, in a sequence, both grass crops, so you whack the heck out of broadleaf crops for two years. We had uh, corn and soybean together, two warm season crops, so you whack the cool season weeds before you plant those for two years in a row. And we had soybeans and peas together, which are both, both broadleaf, so you whack the grasses two years in a row. See? That two-year magical thing. <clears throat> and I, I've got a thing that shows that that's 97% weed control. And that doesn't work if you do tillage. If you, and I told the guy that did that, that was a problem. And so he did this study here. He placed seeds at three depths in the soil, zero, two, and four inches. And then he measured the number of live seeds yearly for four for three years or something like that so after two years where he put them on the surface only 11 seeds remained viable because they got eaten or they rotted or something happens to them they put them two inches in the soil they they had 28 percent and if you put them four inches in the soil half of them were still alive after two years if you do tillage even a what we learned was even a disc marker on our low disturbance drills would give us a line of wheat. <laughs> so we went to dye markers and now GPS, right? That's prog progression. And then <clears throat> we did a thing at our farm with him. We let the weeds that were there shed one time uh, on little small plots. And then he came out and he tilled one to three inches deep. And then every time we put on herbicide, we threw a tarp over that area in these fields. And so we never put any herbicides on them. And he counted the seedlings yearly for three years. And where, where it was tilled and no-till, there wasn't much difference the first year. We, tillage was just a little higher, but not much. Uh, the second year, 48 and 32, not, still not a huge difference. That two-year break, notice the two-year break when we get out to year three, 33 versus four. 
That's the magic of the two-year break. So if we did wheat, pea, a corn, pea, winter wheat, corn, we'd only have 4% if we were low disturbance, if we had a weed that went to seed in the corn. Uh, if we did corn, pea, corn, or corn, soybean, corn, it would be 32% or 48%. That's too many. So this is where uh, we have no herbicide. We seldom put herbicide in our winter wheat because uh, it's co so competitive in the rotation. So here's where I always say uh, I had my auto steer. Auto steer better than that. And uh, I didn't have my, my self driver on there yet. But that's a skip. And a lot of times you see skips and they're full of weeds. There's a skip that doesn't have the weeds. Okay? And that's common for us. And, and the guys that started the shepherd's grain thing, which you guys should probably look at, um, that's what got them. They came to our farm, and we had a skip in a cornfield, and they, they all just stood there and looked at it. And I couldn't figure out, you know, I'm just walking along, talking to them, and turn around, there's nobody behind me. <laughs> and I went back about 50 feet, and they're all standing there, and you're going, where'd the weeds go? I said, well, good rotations and a lot of residue, you don't really have the weeds. Okay. Some experts propose using tillage as a means of addressing weed resistance. If tillage was good at getting weeds, the damn thing should all be gone by now. <laughs> right? We've done enough tillage, we should have them gone. Uh, <clears throat> rotation impact on wheat yields in that long-term study. Uh, wheat, alternate year, uh, wheat fallow type thing, wheat corn something. These are fallow peas, lentils. Um, well, we had, we had legume and oil seed, you know, legume and oil seed in fallow in that thing. Here's a, if you're going to do half wheat, you'd be better off doing two wheats and two out. And we learned that because of the farm program. We, we all had 50% wheat bases, and guys wouldn't give them up. If we're going to do half wheat, we're better off to do it two years in and two years out. We now do this same rotation two years in. And then add a second corn in there, and we're three years out. And that's our best rotation, actually. And here's an alternate year broadleaf type thing, or a heavy broadleaf thing that, that gives you a big response to wheat because it's an extra year out. Okay, that's, that's in that study that went in the, the 90s up to the early 2000s. When I was doing that, here's the economics, 1990, or you know, late 90s uh, numbers. Uh, winter wheat fallow costs 460 a bushel. Winter wheat corn fallow 379. Winter wheat corn P 245. And all the wheat fallow guys would say, "Well, you can't make any money on them damn peas." And then we, well, I don't have to make money on peas. I just have to lose less money, and it costs me to summer fell. <laughs> Relatively simple. And they'd look at me like, "Oh, you're smart ass," you know. That's. <laughs> You know anything about the soil, what you want to know, organic matter. And we talked about that before. And I showed that yesterday. Here's a long-term thing we have going. We've had these rotations since 1990. So we started them in 1990. In, in 2002, the one on the bottom, we had a dry year. And the, the wheat corn, this is the total water from the time we harvested the peas until we harvested the winter wheat. 12 months, okay? And count snow, counting the snow. 56 versus 28 bushel, what's the difference here? The year before the winter wheat is pea in both cases, the winter wheat before the, the year before the peas is corn in both cases. So what's the difference? We got that extra broadly for every other year. The Montana rotation in northeastern Montana is Wheat, chickpea, wheat, chickpea, wheat, chickpea, wheat, chickpea, every other year. You know, so they've broken a lot of rules. But it's not enough residue. And it bites you. In 2005, when it was wetter, 23 inches, 92 versus 57. In 2006, when it was dry again, 60 versus 29. Organic matter makes a difference. We didn't see that the first four or five years because we were still building organic matter from that wheat fallow uh, mess that we had. So there's a picture in 2006 of the, the low residue or the alternate year type rotation. And right across the road, it looked like that. 
pretty easy to see. There's an infrared photo of it from an airplane. See, we got all these techie guys. They, you know, now we can do this with a drone. We could call up the people and they could fly their little thing across there, their satellite, and take pictures every day. Uh, <coughs> same type of principle works in, in uh, irrigation. This is the irrigation ground. Uh, we've got corn on continuous corn rotation. We've got a um, corn soybean rotation, and then we've got a corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean rotation, which is, which is more diverse and it has a cover crop in here and that kind of thing, right? And when we put the cover crop in there, it's a better yield. First year, no cover crop is behind the corn. Uh, don't really have time. Second year, we have the wheat with a cover crop. <coughs> Look at these yields. And you compare those to where we just have corn soybean, 62. So 62.9 where we do corn soybean, 78.8 average on those two years, we do beans in that more diverse rotation. That's huge. And guys in the Corn Belt say, well, I can't afford to not do corn soybean. And I'm thinking you can't afford to do corn soybean if you're only doing 62 bushel. And then <coughs> our continuous corn, the field that Monty showed you yesterday, uh, the soil's in, that's in our continuous corn field. It's our best soil because it's had the most carbon over the years in irrigated corn, but it doesn't yield as well. 203 corn soybean, normally we get 217. Uh, corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, those two fields together will average about 235, you know, 250 or something or a little better on the, on the first year corn and the second one's like 217 or whatever. So if I look at the economics of that, if I have 5,000 acres, I get a million bushels of corn. If I have 5,000 acres of corn and that's all I have, I also have a great big grain dryer and lots of semis and whatever. Uh, corn, soybean. You look at those numbers, corn, corn, soybean, wheat, soybean, if you look at that, it's really interesting. In this one, this one you have 5,000 acres of corn. Here you have 2,500 acres of corn, 2,500 acres of soybeans. Here you have 2,000 acres of corn, 2,000 acres of soybeans, 1,000 acres of wheat, right? That's how that works. I get more beans total on 2,000 acres than I do on 2,500 acres. So, does it make sense to trade 7,200 acres bushels of corn for 120 bushels of, 120,000 bushels of wheat and 350 bushels of soybeans with less pest issues? Well, I think so. So I don't know where they get the idea they can't afford to do that. So, rotations. And this will be in your book. So I'll fly through this. Simple rotations are predictable. You do the same thing the same way every time through. So wheat, corn, canola, spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, sunflower, winter wheat, corn, pea, corn, soybean. It's the same. It's simple. It's easy. And you can tell the hired man to go out and spray all the ground that's going to be corn next year with atrazine or whatever, and he can't get screwed up because he just goes into all the wheat, wheat stubbles, right? Simple. Uh, <clears throat> limited number of crops to manage the market. Limited, limited in all corns behind the wheat or all all wheats into spring wheat or whatever. It's always the same. Rotation with perennial sequences, which I think we're going to have to go to, so we do maybe even a really simple rotation and then we do alfalfa. Or we do grass or something like that and we kind of hit the reset button. Uh, limited number of annual crops to manage the market, excellent place to spread manure, probably can produce more soil structure than any annual crops if you have grass or grass mixtures. If you're harvesting alfalfa and selling the alfalfa, it's the worst thing in the world you can do your ground. Because all your nutrients have gone away and you don't have high residue left. Uh, biomass crops may hold potential to make you frustrated. <laughs> but grazing uh, works, right? Um, uh, <clears throat> anyway, uh, difficult to manage the fish and percentage of land and perennial crop without grazing, but it, it, has, it has a lot of potential if you graze. So we've changed that really bad rotation that I showed you. We've taken out that thing. We now have that three-way rotation. It's wheat, corn, bean, that, or wheat, corn, pea. That's pretty good. It's not our best rotation. Then we add a five-year perennial sequence in there. So we have 15 years of cropping in five years of perennial grass, we're using the tall grass prairie stuff. 
Uh, compound rotations where we combine two simple rotations. It goes spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, soybean, corn, soybean. So we do the two simple rotations, corn, bean, and spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, soybean, and we combine those. I call this my mother-in-law or my banker rotation. <coughs> or my worst case scenario, my mother-in-law is my banker. <laughs> Okay. So she comes to visit in June, which corn do I show her? And in central South Dakota where it's dry, I show her the corn and the soybeans. This one down here. Because it's big and green, looks great. She comes in August, early September after we've had a dry Ju July and August, I show her this one. It spreads my risk. In a wet year, this one's great. Dry year, this one's great. Normal year, they're both fine. This one's cheaper because you don't have the wheat stubble to manage. Limited number of crops to manage creates more than one sequence for some crop types. Uh, I have a limited ability to spread the workload. I'm still kind of filling my, uh, they had three, three windows there. Rotation where crops with the same crop type vary. Barley instead of spring wheat, corn, sunflower, millet, pea, instead of having uh, corn and beans in both of those. So you start, and we do some of that where we put in sorghum as a complementary crop. Uh, <clears throat> capable of creating a wide array of crop type by sequence combination, complementarity, complementarity in, in, in other words, sorghum and corn don't share diseases, but they share a similar niche. Uh, the disadvantage it requires a lot of crop management and marketing skills. But that's why we're paying you the big bucks. It's not because you drive your tractor well, because we can do that automatically now. So it, you get a reward for that complexity. Uh, stacked rotations, we, ran, we, we figured this out when we were facing trying to uh, deal with a farm program. And some of you are old enough to remember this. But we had 50% wheat bases. Guys are not going to do a rotation where they lose base prior to the Dashiell Freedom to Farm thing. And so instead of doing wheat, canola, wheat, pea, or something like that, uh, we stacked the two wheats. And we found out that worked really well. That's one of those things that surprised us. So we have now rotation under irrigation where we do wheat, wheat, corn, corn, soybean, soybean. We have the one on dry land that does wheat, wheat, sorghum, corn, broadleaf. So we stack in a regular basis, and it does some really interesting things for us. Uh, attempt to keep pest population diverse or confused because there's diversity in both sequence and interval. Sequence is what crop follows which, and interval is how long. Okay. Uh, in the east, in the western corn belt, we have an extended corn rootworm beetle. Uh, normally, you would only have gotten corn rootworm if you planted corn on corn in the old days. Uh, Beetle laid on the, on the silks, laid her eggs at the base of the plant. Kids hatched the next year. If you had corn, they ate them. If they didn't have corn, they died. And after everybody started doing corn and soybeans, we all of a sudden, just like weed seeds, we developed a population of corn root, rootworm beetles that their eggs waited two years to hatch. Extended diapause. There's always been some of the eggs didn't hatch for two years, but we actually developed a whole new species. In the eastern corn belt, they have the soybean variant, right? And the, and the females fly to the soybean fields to lay their eggs. Okay, I call them the blonde root rootworm beetles, but oh no, that's, I can't do that anymore. I used to, I used to call them the blonde corn rootworm beetle, right? Because they, they have, look at them dumb blondes. But I, I had a, a graduate student of mine that moved, worked for Monsanto and DeKalb and whatever, moved to DeKalb, Illinois for a while. And, and I, he said, well, what do you think we're running into there? And I said, well, the corn rootworm beetles will fly to the soybean fields and lay their eggs. Because you say, you think we'll have extended diapause there? I said, no, the, the, they'll, they'll fly to the soybean fields and lay their eggs, right? And, and about three years later, he called and he said, how in the hell did you know? I said, how did you know what, Dale? He said, I'm sitting here watching these females fly across the road and lay eggs in soybean fields. How did you know that was going to happen? I said, it was a joke, Dale. Yeah. I just made it up. It was a joke. When he asked me, you think you have, you know, they're going to do something. So I just said, yeah, they're just going to fly across the road, thinking he'll never buy into that. And I didn't think they'd do that. Okay. <clears throat> Mix along with short residual herbicides. I can put atrazine in dry country on first-year corn, 
or first year sorghum and not worry about it the next year because I'm going to go back to that crop again. Okay, so it gives us that opportunity to not be always using short, re short residual herbicides. And I have a two year break between corn and wheat which takes care of, takes care of the fusarium, Don and that kind of issue. Uh, the goal is to allow sufficient time for press pressure to decline at very low levels before sequencing the crop two times. Uh, may be capable of reducing the risk of developed myotype resistance, which is exactly right, and reduces the cost of herbicides, which is exactly right. And some sequences may not be ideal, so we don't do this often with broadleaves. We normally do it with just two grasses. Um, but the goal is to be inconsistent in both sequence and interval. Uh, and there are some examples of using both that um, uh, spring wheat, winter wheat, corn, uh, spring wheat, winter wheat, pea, corn, millet, sunflower thing is one that we use on our heavy textured uh, dry land soils, something like that. The rotation must fit the ecosystem and the operator is not a best, there's just not a best answer. I had a young guy one day just kept asking me, he's on a tour, he kept asking me what rotation in this soil and whatever and I'm in here and, and I noticed he still had his wedding ring on which most guys when you farm you kind of put them in the desk after a while after you catch them two or three times and, and I said well I see you just got married he said yeah yeah last week <laughs> I said okay I said who picked your wife and he looked at me and he said well I did I said well then you got to pick your own damn rotation <laughs> First time I went to Argentina, they were doing seven years of cropping, seven years of pastures, and using cover crops, that's uh, black oats and hairy vetch on the left there. Uh, seven years, of, pat, uh, cover, uh, seven years of, of cropping, seven years of pasture, and then cover crops and three-way rotations and all that stuff. And, and that was cover crop on the left and no cover crop on the right, and there's actually a difference in stand that you can see there. But the thing I wanted to show you is this. You want a definition of a healthy soil. That's it. And then, <clears throat> this was in 1996. Some of you probably weren't alive in 96. But, <clears throat> and then they outlawed the export of beef. Main reason was they wanted more tax dollars. And what the tax dollars come from, they take 34% of the beans at the at the port. So they outlawed the export of beef so the pastures went away and the guys started doing soybeans and soybeans. This is that same spot in the same field in 2006. You want to see that again? So it happens very fast. Organic matter makes a difference. There's my three daughters when they were really young. They're all uh, Rika just turned 29, that's the one on the right, and the other one's 20, the little one's 24 and getting married next year. Uh, <clears throat> but there's a root of a prairie plant. Compare that to corn and beans and whatever, it's not even close. Uh, we put in a frost-free water or one of those thermal sinks or whatever, you have to bury them to seven foot, and I put it out in some of our tall grass plantings, and I had roots going past seven on those. Yeah, and they're working all the time. They're working all the time, even in the winter time. So anyway, it's been fun to be with you this morning. I, we got an hour for questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this great session from the Ag Emerge stage with Dr. Beck. At best, I hope you get a chance to see him in person. And at the least, I hope he spurred you on to continue to ask questions and explore your soil systems. As Dr. Beck said, weeds and diseases are nature's way of adding diversity to a system that lacks diversity. And if you'd like to learn more about how we work with growers to create a systems approach to diversity and soil health, check out our website at asn.farm. And there you can find ways to connect and follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, LinkedIn, and YouTube. There's a lot of great things happening and always something to learn. Thanks for listening.